Jill about to come? Or to... Okay, so I'll have to start then. All right. Yeah. Right, we will start in prayer ourselves. <laughs> Father, thank you for bringing us here today. Lord, I pray that you will teach us from your word, as I am inadequate for this. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be always acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Four sessions now, we've done on the same verse that we got up there. We are continually, or they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to breaking of bread, and to prayer. If I wanted to, I could probably do another ten sessions on the subject of prayer throughout the Bible. Um, I will not be, this will be it. So, I've I feel like a five-year-old doing a lecture on astrophysics um, while trying to speak on the subject of prayer. So I'm not going to tell you what I think. I'm going to tell you what Jesus thinks. And so the, the first set, which I'm going to, the first set of uh, verses on there, I've printed them all out so we can rattle through them quickly. These are cases where Jesus prayed. He himself prayed. So not necessarily his teaching on prayer, we'll get on to some of, some of that. But this is where Jesus himself prayed. And the first question is, why would Jesus need to pray? Why would God need to pray to God? It's a good question. It's okay. So let's, let's go through these. If you want to catch them up, if not, I'm just going to rattle through them. Uh, we're starting off at Luke, what, Luke 11 verse 1. Uh, the, these aren't relevant to the actual study. These are for afterwards. I'll explain what these are afterwards. So Luke 11 verse 1. And it came about while he was praying, that's Jesus, in a certain place, after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. Now the reason is, at that time all Jewish prayer was out of the prayer book. They had a set liturgy they were supposed to follow. The C of E is supposed to be a set prayer book with all the liturgy out of a set book. I mean, they're set up for good reason. People who know about scripture know about them, so we write these down so that people know the right things to say. And if you go through the, the Book of Common Prayer for the C of E, you will find the gospel completely laid out in there in a correct and appropriate way. The old ones, anyway. Um, and so I think the Jewish prayer books were the same idea. They were trying to, right, let's make sure that everybody says the right thing, does the right thing, doesn't get it out of order. The problem is, if you just read, our Father is in heaven, hallowed be your name, mm -hmm. thy kingdom come, I will be done on earth as it is in heaven, give us today our day bread, and fill us as it is, etc, etc, etc. Amen. Thank you, Lord. We've prayed. Just by saying it, doesn't mean it. So here comes along Jesus, and you can imagine when Jesus prayed, he prayed. If we look at the next, next one, Luke 3, 21 to 22. And you probably haven't noticed this. It's the story of Jesus' baptism. Now it came about when all the people were being baptised that Jesus also was baptised. And while he was praying, heaven was opened. And the Holy Spirit descended on him bodily in the form of like a dove. And a voice out of heaven said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. While he was praying, heaven opened. I mean, that's what prayer is about, isn't it? When Jesus prayed, the heavens opened. That's different. The next one, Luke 5. And it's 15 to 16. But the news about him was spreading even further, and multitudes were gathering to hear him, and he healed their sickness but he himself would often slip away into the wilderness to pray. So here's even Jesus needing to spend time in prayer. And going to Luke 6, 12 to 13. And it was at this time that he went off to a mountain to pray and sent the whole, whole night in prayer to God. And when day came, he called the disciples to him and chose 12 of them whom he named apostles. So Jesus, who knows everything because he's God, had to spend a whole night in prayer before he chose the 12 apostles. 
And another one, another mountain. This is um, after the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, so it's Matthew 14 this time, Matthew. Immediately, now Jesus had just fed the, the 5,000 plus. Before this, um, he had been rejected as being the Messiah and declared to be demon possessed. He had um, spent a whole day preaching. He'd had lots of problems. He'd now found out that John the Baptist was dead, had been beheaded. He had sent his disciples away on a mission. They had come back bouncy. You can imagine you're down and you have all these bouncy people coming back. So he has to, as it were, debrief them, talk to them. He's got the grief of knowing that John the Baptist is dead. He's got the grief of knowing that that means he's next. So he leaves the area, gets on the boat, goes across the Sea of Galilee, wants to have some private time with his disciples, private time to pray. All the people leg it round. He has compassion. He then spends the whole day teaching. Then he spends the whole day breaking and breaking and breaking and breaking and breaking the bread. At the end of that time, everybody then says, this is wonderful, let's make him king by force and let's chuck the Romans out. So Jesus here sends the disciples away because they are very vulnerable to what the crowds think and then he disappears up into the mountain so just read this one and immediately he made the disciples get into a boat and go ahead of him to the other side and while he sent the multitudes away and after this he had sent the multitudes away he went up into the mountain by himself to pray and when it was evening he was there alone i was looking up various different words for prayer in the bible in my uh, Young's Analytical Concordance, which is all the authorised, there was, I think, 23 or 26 different words used for prayer, translated from, in, from Hebrew and Greek into prayer in English. You know, the old English text say, well, what are you doing? Pray tell. Some of them are like that. Um, some of them were, in some ways, I pray thee, tell me now. They're almost violent forms of prayer, if you like. It's demands. This type of one, uh, the word I like best it is a pouring out. Mm. Imagine the, uh, uh, mm. where they used to have libations, where they pour out wine to, to God, or they pour out blood in the case of the Jews. This type of prayer is a pouring out. And you can imagine Jesus going up to that mm. mountain. You and me would be, all right, I'm tired, I'm having a nap. Mm. This is what the disciples did, what everybody did. But Jesus went up there and he poured his soul out to God on the top of that mountain. The result being... The next morning he walked, or that night, he walked across the water at the Sea of Galilee. Matthew 19. There were some, uh, some children were brought to him that he might lay his hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me. Remember that one? We always think about Jesus blessing the little children, but it's not, he prayed for them. And I suspect when Jesus prayed for you, you knew you were prayed for. Yeah. Back to Luke again, Luke 9. And it came about, while he was praying alone, the disciples were with him. He started questioning them, saying, this particular section comes at the end of a, a period in Jesus' life and the disciples, which I call remedial training. He had realised his disciples were a lot thicker than he thought they were. <laughs> and so he had taken them off into a Gentile area and he had been retraining them and retraining them and retraining them. And this is the point when he wants to find out have they learnt. And so Jesus is praying before he asks this question. Who do the multitudes say that I am? And they answered and said, John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Other, uh, but others, one of the prophets of old has risen again. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Mm. And Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the Christ of God. So this is Jesus, please Lord, please Lord, please Lord, let them learn. He's begging, let them learn, let them know. Another prayer, Luke 22. Slightly different one, this one. Luke 22, 31 to 32. And it's Jesus speaking to Simon Peter. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you 
that your faith may not fail. And you, when you have turned, will strengthen your brothers. That word is the word, that prayer in there is the word for begging. Jesus had begged God for Peter. Now, a great big long one, Matthew 26. In some ways, one of Jesus' most favorite, well, is the most, the most important prayer. Matthew 26, it's 36 to 46. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, sit here while I go to pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and distressed. And he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. And he went a little way beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he came to his disciples and found them asleep and said to Peter, So, you men couldn't keep watch with me for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away the second time and prayed, saying, My father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, thy will be done. Again he came and found them asleep. Their eyes were heavy. And he began, say, he left them again and went away and prayed the third time, saying the thing, same thing as before. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping? And take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man will be betrayed into the hands of sinners. Arise, let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. Not my will, but thine. Mm. Isn't that the most important prayer Jesus ever prayed? Mm. Interestingly, that's in three of the Gospels, not in the fourth. We'll come on to that in a minute. We'll just look at the last one. Matthew 26. There's Jesus talking again. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you have come for. Who is he talking to? Yeah. Yeah. Judas. Oh, Judas. Oh, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Friend. Yeah. Friend. Yeah. Do what you have come for. And they came and laid hands on him and seized him. And behold, one of them, who was with Jesus, reached out and drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ears. That was Peter, as we know. And it turns out Peter is a far better fisherman than he is a soldier. The best he, he went to behead a man, the best he could do was cut his ear off. Obviously, Donald Trump should be grateful as, from yesterday. And Jesus said to him, put up your sword into its place, for those who take up the sword will perish by the sword. Do you not think I can appeal to my father? That word appeal is pray. Has anybody got pray in their version? I think in the authorised it used to be pray. Cool. Ask. Ask. Yes, yeah, another word that's translated as pray sometimes. Do you think I cannot appeal to my father? And he will at once put disposable, put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. How then shall scripture be fulfilled as it must happen this way? Mm. That's the prayer that Jesus didn't say. He could have said it. He could have prayed to his father, can I have 12 legions of angels please? I need them. And God would go, okay, done. But he doesn't. So in some ways, the most important prayer Jesus ever said is the one he didn't say. Because he accepted, your will be done. I will not do this. I will take it. So those are some examples of Jesus praying in the Bible. There's probably more that I've missed, a lot more. Jesus was constantly in prayer. And it wasn't from the prayer book. It was... Uh, um, uh, what's the posh word for saying the prayer off your top of your head? Um, no, it's not. No, it was, um, spontaneous. It's not spontaneous. Uh, because... There is a posh word and I will remember it in a couple of seconds time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but these, these are things off his head. Now, Jesus, as we know, gave the, the, the disciples a model prayer. An, an order to prayer. We'll look at that later on. But when Jesus spoke, he didn't read really these words and that. He, he, he came from his heart. He yes. did it in an organised way, yes. but it came from his heart. As I said, three of the Gospels have that bit about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Not thy will, but thine. 
not my will but thine. The other one, John, so if we go to John now, here's another prayer. So John 7, verse 1. And this is what's known as the high priestly prayer. So the first verse is this. These things Jesus spoke, this is in the Garden of Gethsemane, on his way to the Garden of Gethsemane. These things Jesus spoke and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son may glorify thee. Does that sound like a bit of a selfish prayer? Glorify thy Son. I want some glory, Lord. Does it sound dubious? You know it's not, of course, obviously, you know it's not. What was that glory? Mm. Go to Revelations 5. We'll see what that glory actually... Keep your finger in, John, because we'll come back to that in a second. If we go to Revelations 5, we'll see what that glory cost him. So it's the whole of, um, the whole of 5. And I saw in the right hand, this is, this is the, the throne room of heaven. And God's sitting on the throne with a book in his hand. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on, um, sat on the throne a book, written inside and out and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and break the seals? And no one in heaven on earth or under the earth was able to open the book and look in it. And I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book and look into it. And one of the elders said, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome, and is able to open the seven seals. And I saw between the throne, with the living creatures and the elders, a lamb standing as if it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which were the seven spirits of God sent out into the earth. And he came and he took out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having harps and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Mm -hmm. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break the seals, for you were slain and is purchased for God with your blood, men of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And thou, thou hast made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God. Remember that, a kingdom of priests to our God. And they shall reign upon the earth. And I looked and beheld, I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the number of them were myriads upon myriads and thousands upon thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honour and glory and blessing. And every creature and everything in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and in the sea and all things in them are heard saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honour and glory and dominion for ever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Glorify my name. Mm. That was saying, put me on the cross. Mm. Some way that's the same prayer that Jesus said, not, your, not my will but thine. Mm. I wonder how much of that was actually prayed that Peter and John and, and James heard Jesus praying. I wonder how much of this was on there. That's the same prayer. Let's go back to, go back to John. Let's read the rest of it. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had 
with you before the world was. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. But does anyone else want to return to me? I ask on their behalf. I do not ask on behalf of the world, but on those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all things that are mine are yours, and yours are mine. Mm. And I have been glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, and yet they themselves are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are. While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me, and I guarded them, and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, so that the scriptures would be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Mm. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believed in me through their word, that they may also be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Do you do it to us? Yes. Yeah. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, <laughs> that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them, as thou hast loved me. Father, I will, that they also, who thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me, and for the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known me, but I have known me, and these have known that thou hast sent me, and I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. That's what they call the high priestly prayer. Really, that should be the Lord's prayer. That's the one full prayer we have of Jesus is recorded. And it sounds like he's to start with, say, glorify me. Yeah. We find out what the glory is. The whole thing is about praying for his disciples. Did you notice the bit I pray not merely for the people who are here now, but for the ones who will believe? That's us. That's us. Now. So Jesus prayed for us then. If you go on to uh, go on to Romans eight. Romans eight. You know you're in for a good time when you go to Romans 8. Have you got Solomon's prayer in? I haven't put Solomon's prayer in as well, no. Uh, that's too long. I, I, I could have gone a dozen different directions with this. I decided that we'll concentrate more on what Jesus said. Um, so, so, eight. so Jesus was praying for his disciples then. It's so Romans 8.33. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is it who co uh, condemns? Jesus Christ is he who died. Yes, rather he who was raised and is at the right hand of God and who intercedes for us. 
So not merely did he pray for us then, he's sitting on the right hand of God, intercession is a form of prayer, praying for us, sitting on the right hand of God. That's amazing, isn't it? Let's go to John. John 16. Twenty three to twenty seven. In that day, this is Jesus talking during the Last Supper, in that day you will ask me no more questions. Truly, truly I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything, he will give it to you in my name. Until now you have not asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive, that your joy may be fulfilled. These things I have spoken to you in figurative language, an hour is coming when I will speak to you no more in figurative language. But you, I will tell you plainly of the Father, and in that day you will ask in my name. And I do not say that you that I, um, say to you that I will request the Father on your behalf, for the Father Himself loves you, because you have loved me, and have believed. And I, I came forth from the Father. In those days, a priest would go into the, the holy of holies to pray. And he would say prayers on your behalf. Jesus is the high priest, but here it's saying that your prayers will also go, not through me, not through the Holy Mother Mary, or any saints, or anything like that, straight to God himself. So, officially when we pray, we should be praying to the Father, not to Jesus. Yeah. But praying in Jesus' name. Yeah. Praying in Jesus' name, we can have anything. I have a prayer for you. Let us pray. Oh Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? <laughs> my friends all drive Porsches, so I must make amends. I work hard all my life, no help from my friends. Oh Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? Oh Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Oh Lord, won't you buy me a colour TV? Dialing for dollars is trying to find me. I wait for delivery each day after three. Oh Lord, won't you buy me a colour TV? Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. <laughs> oh Lord, won't you buy me a night on the town? I'm counting on you, please don't let me down. Show me you love me and buy the next round. Oh Lord, won't you buy me a night on the town? We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. A Mercedes Benz will be turning up outside immediately. <laughs> Famous pop song from um, somewhere in the past. Do you think that's what it means? I know you lot don't know that, but, but that's what it, it says. Ask everything in Jesus' name. So what does that mean? Yeah. So the question is, what does that mean? Let's turn over. Let's turn over. If you want plain speaking, go to James. So let's go to James 4. James 4 to start with. James doesn't take prisoners. So it's James 4 and it's the first 10 verses. What is the source of quarrels and conflict amongst you? Is it not the source of your pleasure and wage war in your members? You lust and you do not have. You commit murder. He's writing to a Christian church here. You commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain. So you fight and quarrel and you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask for the wrong motives, so that you may spend it on your own pleasures, you adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Wherefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you not think that scripture speaks to no purpose when it says, he, is jealous, he jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us? But he gives greater grace, therefore, and he says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Mm. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Mm. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. That's Jesus' half-brother. You ask a miss. Um, if you look on the notes there, 
that you've got a, a picture of the priest. Can you remember the tabernacle? Um, the tabernacle in the wilderness when it was first set up, the simpler one than the... You, you went through past the altar, you went past the laver, you, um, you went into the, the holy place. In the holy place on one side... You, the white... you set it up in the hallway. Oh yeah, I did. You're right. It was lovely. Yeah. How many people got it? On one side, you have uh, the table of showbread, with the, the 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 purified, perfect bread. On the other side, you have the the candlestick. In front of the the the, um, the veil before the holy of holies, you had the altar of incense, and that's where the high priest would go, and would burn incense, um, and then pray. And if you look at the other picture there, Nabad and Abihu. Do you remember the, the story of Nabad and Abihu who burned a strange fire? The fire on the altar was only to be taken, or the fire on that altar of incense was only to be taken from the main altar outside, nowhere else. And only a certain incense was used. And they, for some reason, decided they were going to take fire from somewhere else and burn the incense, and God killed them. Just like that. Which is. Yeah, yeah what well, way precisely why, why do we do things when we know fortunately for us when we pray amiss god doesn't necessarily smite us down immediately but, but this is one of the reasons the jews made a prayer book up so that you you said the right thing so god didn't smite you down it's one of the reasons the church of england does it so that the church of england doesn't smite you down or the catholic church doesn't smite you down um it's, it's one of the reasons behind it but for whatever reason they were asking amiss they were asking in the wrong way for these things and spiritually speaking, we can ask for Mercedes-Benz in the wrong way. The question is, should we be preparing for a Mercedes-Benz in the first place? Uh, but anyway. No, it's <laughs> can you remember what, in the book of Revelations, when we read it there, I pointed out to you, it says, you're a kingdom of priests. The priest who can go directly up to that veil before the presence of God and pray. And so all of us have to pray in the right way if we want to be heard. So if you're praying for Mercedes-Benz, probably not. Something lower down the line, maybe, but not Mercedes-Benz. <laughs> now, the strange thing to think is, why do we need to pray at all? There's a point in the scripture that actually says God knows what you need before you ask him. So why do we need to pray? It's a bit weird, isn't it? Now the reason is, let's go back to Genesis. Virtually everything starts in Genesis. And by understanding this, we'll understand one of the main purposes of prayer. So Genesis 1, and it's 27 to 31. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule it over the fish and the seas and the birds in the skies and over every living thing that moves on earth. Rule over the earth. So mankind has been given authority over the earth. What that means, they've been given stewardship. And so what God has done, okay, you run it. I won't interfere. You run it. And now Satan, as we know the story, <laughs> Satan, he, he can't actually take over the earth. God has made a rule that man is in charge of the earth. Satan cannot come in and take over, but nor will God. Satan obviously worms his way in the side and tries to get in. Ultimately, the reason Jesus was a man is because a man rules over the earth. The reason the Antichrist will be a man is because a man has to rule over the earth. But if God just stepped back and said, okay, you get on with it. And God is now looking down and going, oh... what do I do? And there's times God steps in. Flood, for instance. That's the time God yeah. stepped in. Yeah. 
But when he steps in, he can't do it keyhole surgery. Now that's story, why doesn't God kill all the nasty people? Why didn't God kill Hitler? Why doesn't... God actually can't do keyhole surgery like that. He has to do right. Judgment, everybody. And God won't interfere on the earth unless he is asked by man. So one of the main reasons for prayer is that God, he wants to interfere, he wants to do things, but he can't unless we ask him. Because, Remember Jesus went to... Because he gave us dominion. Yeah. So. Yeah. Remember Jesus went to the, the synagogue in Nazareth and he was amazed at their lack of faith. And he, he says that he could only heal a few sick folk. He couldn't do any great work, he could only heal a few sick folk. I, I would be happy to heal a few sick folk. <laughs> But he was a mate. He, Jesus, could not do it because of their lack of faith. God will not help because of our lack of faith. Go to Ezekiel, Ezekiel 22. There's a famous, famous verse there. Um, when a city was under siege, what would happen is um, the enemy would attack a certain section of the wall and they would try to knock it down. And once they had knocked a hole through the protective wall, they would obviously then attack. And the bravest men would go and stand in that hole. And they would then fight face to face with the enemy. So Ezekiel 22, and it's 25 to, to 31. There is a conspiracy of her prophets. Here God's talking about the, the prophets who are lying. So they're lying to Israel. Basically there's, there's a hole in Israel. There's a big whacking hole knocked by the enemy into Israel. Idolatry and everything else is coming in here. And God is looking to see who's, who is willing to stand in that gap and protect my people from this lie, from this idolatry that's coming in. There is a conspiracy of our prophets in the midst of her, like a roaring lion tearing the prey. They have devoured um, lives. They are taking treasure and precious things. They have made, made m many widows in the, in the midst of her. Her priests have done violence to my law. They have profaned my holy things. They have ma made no distinction between the holy and the profane. They have not taught the difference between the unclean and the clean. They are hiding their eyes from my Sabbaths. I am profaned amongst them. C of E? Um, anyway, I digress. Her princes within her are like wolves tearing the prey and shedding blood and destroying many lives in order to get dishonest gain. Her prophets have smeared whitewash on them, seeing false visions and, div and divining lies. They are saying, thus saith the Lord God, when the Lord God has not spoken, the people of the land have practiced oppression and committed robbery. They have wronged the poor and the needy. They have, no, they have oppressed the sojourners without justice. I searched for a man amongst them who would build up the wall and stand in the gap before me. For the land that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. I have poured out my indignation on them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their, their, their ways I have brought upon their head, declares the Lord. The person he wants to stand in the gap is a prophet, someone who will say the word of the Lord. When we pray, often we are standing in the gap. So with the C of E at the moment, voting for blessings of same-sex marriages. Those of us who believe that that's probably not the best thing, It's, it's allowing the sin into the church. Do we stand in the gap? Do we pray to stop sin coming into the church? To stop lies? They're telling lies to people. Yes, God will bless you. No, he won't. No. You'll be fine. Yes, you'll, you can still go to heaven. Yes. No. It's not a lie. Everything's true. Yes, come on in. And God's going, no. My son died. Just, I love these people. Yes, I love them. But I want them to know the truth. And you're lying. Yes. You're doing it for dishonest gain. God said, will someone stand in the gap? And prayer is a way we stand in the gap. Because often 
when we pray, Lord, can you help us? Can you do something? Now what he does isn't necessarily what we would want. Lord, won't you destroy these horrible enemies? Won't you wipe them off the face of the earth? God doesn't necessarily do that. Let's go to 1 John. 1 John. Now 1 John's pretty pretty big on prayer actually. I think we're back and forwards here a few times. Someone want to read this one for me? Uh, so it's 1 John chapter 3, 18 to 22. Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and truth. Are we doing that one? Yeah. Yeah, okay. <coughs> I've lost it. You've gone somewhere. This then is how we know what we, that we belong to the truth, how we set our hearts at rest in his presence, whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we obey his command and do what pleases him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. Those who obey his commands live in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. once again a promise to give us what we asked but if what we're asking is in his will we can ask things God for things that we think is a good idea but he's going actually no I can see why you think that but it's not a good idea think of poor old Job we've got to poor old Job he didn't know what was going on at the time he thought he was the most miserable worm on earth, that he'd been abandoned by everybody. Everybody was having a go at him. But what was going on, and he didn't know it, there was a trial going on. And it wasn't him who was on trial, it was God. Because Satan had accused, Satan means the accuser, he had accused God of being wrong about humanity. Of being wrong that humans only are interested in what they can get out of you. And now God, as it were, stepped off his throne, and got into the box of the accused and the person he called up to defend him wasn't an angel it was Job and God couldn't say to Job here mate this is what we're doing just do it now I see you all right okay because that's cheating so here's poor Job he doesn't know why all these horrible things are happening to him that Satan's doing he thinks it's God but at the end when it comes to those final words he says I, I I, I don't know why this is happening to me, but I accept that God is just. Mm -hmm. And I will believe in him. Mm -hmm. And that's the moment that everyone in heaven was listening to his words. Because according to his words, God will be found innocent or guilty. And God was found innocent. And a man defended God. That's what the church is doing. As mankind, we are defending God by our actions and some of the things that happen to us some of the things that happen in the world the Christians have been slaughtered across the world but we are defending God anyway I digress you've got a picture of Job down there actually as well first prayer often Genesis 20 let's go to Genesis 20 As I've said many times before, the first time a, a word or an idea comes into the Bible is often um, sets the tone for how it is to be understood in the Bible. And the first prayer is actually commanded by God, the first prayer I can find. And at the top of my this particular chapter, chapter 20, I've got Abraham's treachery as the title. Anybody else got that? Abraham deceives it, doesn't it? Yeah. So, treachery, I think, is a bit of a hard word, but in those days, if a king wanted a, a wife and he sees somebody else with a beautiful woman, that's simple, just kill the husband. You don't have to go through the divorce process. Mm -hmm. So, Abraham got Sarah to say, he's my sister, which is half true because it actually is his half-sister. And Abimelech sees her and does what kings do, takes her. 
God has a word with Abimelech on the subject. And if we go to verse 7, the first time prayer is said in the Bible. Now, therefore, restore this man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you will live. But if you do not restore her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. So here's the first mention of prayer in the Bible. If you like, one sinner praying for another sinner. And it's commanded by God. One sinner is to pray for another sinner and they will be saved. When was the captivity of Job um, turned? Do you know that? End of the end of Job? Let's go to that then. Job 40, yeah. Job 42. So, this is after the conversation. After God has dealt with Job. Actually praised Job. He comes to deal with his three friends. And it came about the Lord has spoken these words to Job. That the Lord said to his three mates. Who I'm going to. My wrath is kindled against you and against your two friends because you have not spoken what is right as my servant Job has. Now therefore, take yourselves seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant and offer up burnt offerings for yourself and my servant Job will pray for you and I will accept him, uh, accept him so that I may not, uh, not do to you according to your folly because you have not spoken for me what was right as my servant Job has. And verse 10 is the important one. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he prayed for his friends. And the Lord, um, and the Lord interceded all that Job, or increased all that Job had twofold. So all the nasty things that happened to Job when he prayed for his friends were sorted out. What did Jesus say on the cross when they crucified him? Now, whether that was to do with the people who were driving the nails in, or whether that was to do with the Jewish leaders, I don't know. He doesn't say. What did Stephen say when they were stoning him to death? Do not let this sin come yeah, against them. Let's go to Revelations. Possibly a slightly misunderstood section. We're going to talk about censors again. We're talking about prayer and incense and prayers of the saints. And it's one to five. And this is when Jesus, had, uh, the, the lamb, had finished breaking the seals in the book. And when he broke the seventh seal, there was a silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who were standing before God and seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar, holding a golden censer with much incense in it, was given to him. And he laid it on it, and taught it the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar that was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with his prayer and the saints went up before God out of the angel's hands. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it to the earth. And there followed peals of thunder and sounds and flashes of lightning and earthquakes. So when you first think of that, this sense of being thrown down, what do you think? What do you think these prayers were for? For judgment? Lord, look what these horrible people have been doing to your people. Have judgment upon them, put it in there, throw it down. That's how it certainly appealed to me when I first looked at it. This is, this is the judgment, all the, the prayers of the saints for destruction of their enemies. Throw it down and do it. But is that what Jesus told us to do? No. What did Jesus tell to do to our enemies? Pray for them. Pray for them. Pray them. To love them. So that was mercy. Yeah. So we've now got judgment is about to start on the earth. Yeah. The earth is about to be <laughs> yeah. destroyed, almost virtually destroyed. But the prayers of the saints are being thrown down to the earth and the prayers are going up for their enemy to save people. So this is actually is the opposite to what it appears on the surface. If you go back a chapter, back to 7. It's 9 to 17. These are slightly out of chronological order here. 
Um, chapter 7 is um, an overview of the whole thing. But those prayers are thrown down to earth before the judgment starts. Prayers for mercy, and this is the result of those prayers. And after these things I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could count out of every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with white palms in their hands. And they were crying out with a loud voice saying, Salvation for our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels who were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, they fell on their face before the throne and worshipped. Even in judgment, as a, a, a prayer said, Lord, in, in your judgment, remember mercy. Mm. These prayers that are on that altar are not prayers for judgment, they're prayers for mercy. The earth is doomed, the earth system is doomed, Satan is doomed, yeah. but there's people who need to be saved. You have the, the, the witnesses, the Jewish witnesses who go out into the earth. What we're doing is we're praying for them. We're praying for those missionaries that God will send out into the worst time this earth has ever known. We're praying for those people of the earth and multitudes upon multitudes will be saved. So our prayers, these things we say in the earth, oh Lord, oh, oh yes Lord, can I pray for, pray for the world. Pray for the hungry, I'll pray for, yeah, that's not what it's supposed to be. But God hears those prayers. I think of prayer as walking into the throne room of God. And there's God on his throne and you walk in. Imagine a servant walking in before his master. Yeah. 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 There's a command you know, for the mm. tribulation. We're praying that this might not happen yeah. in the winter. Yeah. But the bodies are full. Praying yeah. that... That, you know. And we're praying for our enemies. And so you can imagine all those true Christian prayer is praying for other people. Yeah. It's not praying for ourselves. Yeah. A bit of Zen Buddhism for you. I did Greek stuff last time, we did Zen Buddhism this time. Um, an older monk was trying to explain to a younger monk what heaven was like. And he said, Well, it's like this imagine a, a room full of food, loads of food, but you can only eat it with chopsticks. And one group came in there. But the chopsticks were <coughs> enormously long and they're trying to get it up to them and they can't and they all go away starved. Another group come in, but instead of trying to eat themselves, they feed it to others. Yeah. And they were happy and clean. Now, that's obviously Zen Buddhism, it's not what we're talking about. Uh, but you get the idea. If we're praying for ourselves all the time, Lord I want this, Lord I want this, do that, oh stop this happening to me we're praying for others and they're praying for us and if all of us are working out what the will of God is this church was dedicating itself to the teachings of the apostles it was dedicating itself to fellowship it was joining in with the mission it was giving itself it was joining in with uh, they were a family the table of the Lord was a family a household and now they're praying for each other they're praying for their enemies they're praying for that and over all of that you have the Holy Spirit that's why this church was so spectacularly successful in spiritual terms in physical terms when we get to the next time we'll get onto persecution but that's what every church is supposed to be like Praying for, not for ourselves, not praying for, but praying for others according to the will of God. Finding out what the will of God is. They were finding out the teaching of God through the Jesus, through the apostles. This is what he's telling you to pray for. This uh, bookmark you've got. It's not really my work, I've nicked it off one of my favourite favorite teachers who went through the whole of the Bible and found out all the things that it tells us to pray for. So on the section that with a red bit on it, that's all the things we are specifically told in Scripture to pray for. There's quite a lot in there. You notice he put ourselves at the bottom. <laughs> so hopefully you'll recognise quite a few of those from where they come from in the Bible. On the other side, 
um, the components of prayer. So one bit is what how our prayer is supposed to be structured and ordered. So it's not supposed to be haphazard. Most of us don't have a proper prayer time. We're just sitting there and go, oh Lord, um, I've got a busy day tomorrow, can you help me? Oh, whatever, and then go to sleep. If it's like me, as soon as you kneel down, you, <laughs> you asleep on the floor. Just like the disciples, we're in good, good camp, but that's not how it's supposed to be. Let's go to Matthew 6. Let's go to Matthew 6. The Lord's Prayer. As we call, as uh, is come known, or the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples more accurately. We'll finish on this. Hopefully you will know it off by heart. What I want to look at though is the way it breaks it down. The way it controls it. So we start off with verse 5. And when you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners in order to be seen by men. Truly I say unto you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room. And when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father, who sees in secret, will repay you. And when you are, um, when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetitions like the Gentiles do. For they suppose they will be heard by their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. That's a weird one, isn't it? Your father knows. So, and when we look at this, pray like this, this way. Our father who is in heaven. Your children of God. Yeah. Our father. Yes. Hallowed be your name. Mm. Who does hallowing? Who is, does the sacred stuff? Priests. 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 So we're priests. Thy kingdom come. Who's in a kingdom? Subjects. The subjects of the king. Your will be done. Who does the will of, a, of their master? A servant. Give us this day our daily bread. Who has to hold their hand out and ask for daily bread? A beggar at the gates. Forgive us our sins as we, or our debts as we forgive those who forgive us yes. our debts. Who asks for forgiveness of debts? Yes. Those in cr criminals, basically. We're debtors, we're criminals mm. before the presence of God. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. No, the evil one. Well, the evil one, sorry, yeah, the evil one. And Stephen, that's where I've got a problem with, mm -hmm. with the church, the ge ge generic evil, mm -hmm. where we should be saying the evil one. Yeah. Because if it's generic, you don't take it seriously. Yeah. But if it's the evil one, you do. So I don't think we should have changed it. Yeah, I think in this 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 one in Matthew here, I've just got evil, but in one of the other ones, it's got the evil one yeah. from evil it. One. No, no, I, I, no. I, I never pray the prayer now. Evil, I always say the evil one. Mm. Because yeah. to me that makes it much more powerful. Yeah. I mean that last bit makes us blind. Lead us. We can't see where we're going. Yeah. It's like a blind man. Yeah. So you start off from being the son of God, the child of God, you're a priest, you're a subject of his kingdom, yeah. you're a servant or a slave, you're a debtor, you're a criminal, you're a blind man. All in that one prayer. Mm. And we're all those things at the same time. Mm. And when we pray to God at different stages in our prayers, you can't be claiming to be the Son of God all the time. I, I, yes, I'm your son, you've got to do this for me, you've got to do that for me. Mm. Look, I, I, I just need enough to get through the day. Mm. So, that is an utterly inadequate look at the prayer in the Bible. It's a powerful prayer, isn't it? Yeah. When you break it down like that. Yeah. So I think that, that comes from a Scottish church. There's so the Scottish are very much here. Yeah. More parts than yeah. we realise. Yeah. So when Jesus was put that it wasn't so much what to say, it's how to say it. Mm -hmm. How to approach God. Yes, he's our father, but we're also beggars at his door. We're criminals. We're blind. And so that's what we have to recognise when we come into the presence of God. 
and that's why it has to be structured. That's why we have in the church, we have uh, um, obviously confession of sins and things like that. So we follow the, the order through. And that's why when they did the prayer book, they put those things in there. But it has to be more than just saying the words in a prayer book. It has to be in our hearts to understand. And that's where we are miserably failures. And with the apostles, we find ourselves fast asleep while he is praying desperately for us. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane was praying for us and we were asleep. And I guess most of us still are. Mm. On that note, I will inadequately pray. Oh Lord God, if we could see your throne room, if we could see the angels standing amidst them and when we walk <coughs> into it with prayer to speak to you, how different would be our words. Mm -hmm. Lord, we need to know your will and we need to have the, the strength, the grace to do it, no matter what. Lord, you have commanded us to pray for others. You have commanded us to pray for this world, to bring them your word and your light. Father, help us. Amen. Amen. And amen. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I've gone over too long again. I do apologise.